taken uh, passion about children's literacy that I decided to bring a child. Uh, <laughs> this is my son, Julian, and he probably deserves co-authorship on this presentation um, because uh, he actually helped me do some of the research that you'll see in a second. Um, particularly uh, doing the literature review, um, I think, uh, not to speak for him, but I think he enjoyed doing all the cartoons, right? Uh, all the, the Don Quixote cartoons that are out there. Um, he got to watch them all in English and Spanish. And so uh, Snow Day brings him here, um, and uh, maybe he'll get to uh, present as well with me. Um, I, I'm uh, especially grateful that you know they've used this graphic from Picasso to sort of um, publicize the event because this really speaks to exile. Uh, Picasso um, got in trouble with the Franco regime. Right, um, and so he was actually exiled. And while he was in exile, he wrote a series of political cartoons, right, using Don Quixote to criticize the uh, Franco regime. And so, um, you know, that has a, a lot of different residencies. Um, just to let you know, right, what what the purpose of this presentation is about. Um, to examine the utilization of quixotic imitation in transatlantic and hemispheric contexts. Uh, especially by early 20th century transnational Mexican-American writers living in exile in the United States in the wake of the Mexican Revolution. Um, so I'm going to look at a couple of writers um, who left Mexico for the same reasons that Picasso left Spain, right? They're in trouble politically. Um, they're artists, right? And um, so they have to flee for their lives um, and go to the United States. And while in the United States, then, they're using Don Quixote to make some political points, right, um, that they're trying to make about what's going on in their home country. So specifically, this study will explore both satirical, right, the funny aspects, and tragic examples of quixotic invitation found in Daniel Benegas' uh, Las Venturas de Don Quixote Cuando los Piricos Mamen, right? Um, I had the, the pleasure and honor of actually creating the first English translation ever of the novel. And so, for better or worse, I'm the only translator of the novel, right? Um, and, and the other um, book that we'll take a look at um, is Conrado Espinosa's El Sol de Texas. Um, this is the bilingual edition, and again, I'm the English translator. Um, and so this is what I'll talk about. But I like this photo um, because you have these sort of power-generating windmills, right? And do you see the sign? Can you see it? No Quixotes, right? <laughs> we don't want anybody running and, and breaking these windmills. So we see these representations of Don Quixote throughout society in a lot of different contexts. Um, Jorge Luis Borges um, probably has one of the most famous imitations of Don Quixote. Uh, it's a fictional imitation that was authored by a fictional writer, Pierre Menard, right? And what Pierre Menard did was he copied it word for word, right? And it's a really funny story that uh, Jorge Luis Borges writes because, it, how many of you can read the Spanish? Read and understand the Spanish? Um, so, Comprender el Quijote a principios del siglo XVII era una presa razonable, necesaria, acaso fatal. Okay, so writing Don Quijote in the 17th century was Okay, right, it's reasonable that we would do this. It, it makes sense given the time period, right? A principios del 20, the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, es casi imposible. So it's actually a greater feat in the 20th century to write Don Quixote, even after it's been written, right? No en vano han transcurrido 300 años, cargados de complejísimos hechos, right? So given all the history that's happened over the last 300 years, Entre ellos, para mencionar uno solo, el mismo Quijote. So it, it's basically the, the joke of this is that it's harder for somebody to have created Don Quijote after Don Quijote was already written, right? And that's kind of the joke of the short story. But it shows, you know, that there's this great tradition of Quijote imitation, right? But before we get into that tradition, I did want to ask, right? Um, 
I like to do this. So for people who have been in my class, you know that I like to open up my classes this way with KWLs, right? Uh, what do you know? What do you want to know? What have you learned? Hopefully you'll learn something after the end of the presentation. So what do you know about Don Quixote? Julian? Oh, he dreamed of the impossible dream. Okay, we'll give it that. Anybody else? How many of you actually read Don Quixote? Like the entire text? Both parts. And that's actually one of the biggest jokes in the, in the literature, right? In the research, is that there's so much Don Quixote stuff out there, um, and people are familiar with what they believe is the story or the narrative, but nobody actually reads the book anymore, <laughs> right? Because there are cartoon versions, right? There are cinemagraphic versions. You'll see in a second there are ballet versions, right? There are musical versions, which uh, he just referred to. Anything else? What, what do you guys know about Don Quixote? What happens? What, what's the story basically about? Wasn't he uh, a old... Uh conquistador that was riding to uh, relive or I don't know what the word would be to bring back the, the chivalry times of uh, you know the glory days of the Spanish conquistadors or the so the conquistador isn't quite right but you're very very close right especially when you start looking at his dress um, he reminds you of a Spanish knight, right? What he is, is he's an Hidalgo, right? So he's landed gentry, right? Um, and so maybe two or three generations before him, they're still kind of in the Middle Ages, and there's still all these sort of books and stories about knights and all these wonderful deeds that the knights did, and this is why it's important to distinguish, because the conquistadores are now in the Americas, right? And so there is a lot of activity and a lot of adventure, right? But those that are staying back in Spain aren't necessarily participating in those great adventures, right? And society is changing. Society is changing very, very quickly because of all the resources that they're getting from the Americas and their other problems, right? And so... He used to have this really important place in society, to have land, right, to have your own farm, to produce uh, animals, livestock, you know, fruits, vegetables, um, your ability to uh, participate in politics was really um, still, you know, tied to your, your landed status, right, but this is starting to erode. Right? And so this is why he's waxing nostalgic, right, about all these great good glory years, right, of the Middle Ages and the knights errant, right? The knights that right off in the sunset, they do good deeds, they save princesses um, with long hair and towers and, right, and all these kinds of great things. And so he spends all of his time reading these stories, okay? So Don Quixote... He's in a dialogue. He's now old, right? And the joke is, is it an appropriate time to act like a knight? 1605. Not anymore, right? He's about 200 years late to the party. Right? At least 100, 150 years late to the party. And so you can imagine if I came, you know, with a powdered wig and frilly little, uh, you know, uh, clothes and jacket, um, looking like George Washington or something like that, and gave this presentation like that. I, I look pretty silly and out of place, right? Why is he so late? So why is he so late? Because society in Spain is beginning to change, and there's an emergence of a middle class, right? So industrialization, Don Quixote is considered the first modern novel, and it'd be really weird to call a 1605 publication modern, but it's the dawn of modernization, it's the dawn of early industrialization, really early industrialization, now you're with the windmills, right? Um, but you're also dealing with the beginning of globalization. In the beginning of globalization, you have to understand, Spain were the early winners 
of globalization, right? I mean, there's a, it's not by accident that Venezuela, Argentina, all the way up to the United States, right, and through the Caribbean, still speak Spanish, right? It's like half the world was basically colonized by Spain. So all the wealth, right, drained into Spain. So imagine if you were a landed wealthy person, right, and that gave you status. Well, now people who go produce colonies or just go to the Americas and, you know, produce a little bit of wealth, they'll come back. Right? As middle class merchants. And now you've kind of been displaced, right? As kind of the, the prestigious middle class, right? Or uh, landed gentry. And so that's kind of why he's waxing nostalgic because his grandparents, his grand grandparents, they had real status in society. And, and he doesn't so much. And so his solution, right, is to. You know, dress like a knight, right? And go out and fight dragons and giants and all these kinds of things, right? And so, when you hear Don Quixote, what, what are your first associations? The donkey. The donkey. Okay, good. Uh, Sancho's donkey, do we know what happens to it in the story? Doesn't Sancho like a dummy? Yeah, Sancho is kind of the, the foil. He's kind of the dummy. Um, and my son, the first time I heard his full the first name, the name is funny, right? Sancho Panza, right? What's a panza? Belly, right? And so he's big, he's fat, he's silly, he's kind of a goofball. All the sort of bad things happen to him, right? Uh, Don Quixote is the one who's kind of uh, uh, seeing illusions and, and dreams, and but in the end, everything always works out with him. He's like the, the lucky fool, right? Uh, Sancho Panza is like the unlucky fool, right? And so um, his donkey actually gets stolen, right? And it's, it's his prized possession and pet, and, and the donkey gets stolen. Um, often the early associations or the first associations with Don Quixote are the windmills, right? So what happens with the windmills? And that's part of this graphic, too. That is bad. This is probably one of the most uh, famous scenes. Don't he like, think they're like knights trying to get him or something like that? He thinks they're giants, right? So he thinks they're giants and they're, you know, destroying things. And so he imagines the arms, the windmills being the arms of a giant, right? And so Sancho Panza, again, the unlucky fool, is trying to explain to Don Chipotle that they're not giants, they're windmills. And if you go try to attack them, you're gonna get smoked, right? Um, but of course, Don Quixote tells Sancho, no, you're the one seeing things, right? You've been bewitched, you've had a spell cast on you, right? And I'm the one that sees reality, right? And so I'm gonna go attack the giants, and of course, you know, he hits the windmill, the windmill breaks his lance, and he gets thrown up in the air, and all this other kind of stuff. And so um, he ends up losing his battle to the giants, but the point was, I, I tried, right? I did my best, and so that kind of goes with the chivalric code. I tried to save, you know, the damsel in distress. I tried to save society, um, and I fought the good fight. And so, this is actually a comic book, and it's kind of funny. I think um, now most of our introduction, I know my introduction to Don Quixote was as a child, right? In a comic book form. I tried to find a Warner Brothers. I thought there was a Bugs Bunny edition that I saw when I was a little kid. I couldn't find it, but we're still looking, right, with my little research assistant here. Um, what are you guys' first associations, the first time you ever got exposed to Don Quixote in a store? Does anybody know? Do you want to share? Yeah, go ahead. How'd you know? <laughs> I didn't raise my hand, but yeah, I was thinking something. Uh, choir class, actually, in high school. Oh, good. Uh, well, we were looking at a handful of potential songs for musicals to sing for this upcoming thing. And, and yeah, we did uh, Dream of an Impossible Dream. Okay, good. Musical version. Awesome. Somebody else? First time you're exposed yeah. to Don Quixote? Uh huh. Uh, I think I like reading books. Okay, we did. My dad made me do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I watched the movie. 
that watched the movie? Which version? I'm not sure. I think it was in Italian or Spanish or something. Yeah, you'll see many. Um, so I don't have any uh, versions here. We'll get to it in a second. But in Mexico, they've done serious versions, and they've also done comic versions with Cantinflas, right, being uh, Sancho Panza. Um, we'll see that in a second. Obviously, in many, many languages, you'll see uh, movies being made. But it was the 400-year anniversary of Don Quixote. And so you'll see a lot of reproductions around 2004, 2005 to celebrate the 400 years anniversary, right? But it's, it's pretty amazing how ubiquitous uh, Quixote is kind of in society and how Quixote reproduction has become a real commodity, right? So again, the joke that nobody even reads the book anymore, but you see something like this, or you see something like this, you almost immediately recognize that that's Don Quixote, right? Even though you haven't read it. And of course, Spain, you know, takes full advantage of that image, right, as a, as a national image. This is one of the main plazas in Madrid, right? Um, and I should have put our family photos there, right, with him climbing up on the horses and stuff. But um, so it's a very famous plaza. In the background is actually Cervantes, the author, and here uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza are. Um, but then you get these modern adaptations, right? And they're on motorcycles. Um, and so it's a Don Quixote has become a very public sort of literary figure, right? Uh, almost like the original Mickey Mouse, right? The way that it, it, that image has been proliferated, you know, throughout the world. My first association with Don Quixote, uh, Don Quixote, is actually waiting in the line of the border. So I grew up in California, but I right on the border, and I don't know if anybody's ever been to the U.S.-Mexican border. But often they'll have vendors, right? Sometimes children um, selling wares uh, to people that are in line um, waiting at the border, right? I think maybe Canada doesn't do that because it's too cold, right? <laughs> um, but so you have people kind of walking up and down where all the cars are to get back across. And they sell things like piggy banks, right? Plaster piggy banks. But I remember uh, seeing this really fat guy, right? And it was a piggy bank. And I wanted that piggy bank. I didn't want the pig, I didn't want the burro, right? I wanted the really fat, funny looking guy. And my father explained that that was Sancho Panza, right? And I had the same kind of reaction to him when I heard the first, first time the name, right? Of Panza, right? Because it's, 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 it's instantly funny. And so they still make them, these little plaster uh, piggy banks, right? And you put the coins in Sancho Panza's belly. Right? So you see these kind of things everywhere, but you see the representations in art as well, right? And so I'm going to show a couple examples. my son for helping me do this research. Um, Mikhail Baryshnikov um, also did his own version and this almost speaks to um, the sort of commodification of Don Quixote as a literary figure because Mikhail Baryshnikov's version, Don Quixote doesn't even appear until late in the first act. Like Don Quixote as a title for the ballet is almost just a mechanism to sell tickets. Right? And you would imagine that usually the title character, the most famous dancer, 
they would be the same person, right? Um, and in the Mikhail Baryshnikov version, he's not Don Quixote, right? And Don Quixote plays a very minor role in his ballet, right? And, and Mikhail Baryshnikov is the featured sort of dancer. Um, this might be one of the most famous songs associated with uh, Don Quixote. The mission basically a film version of the Man of La Mancha musical, right? And so it's really interesting that P Sir Peter O'Toole's version, cinematographic versions, becomes one of the most important movie versions, right, of Don Quixote, um, and it's based on a, a musical for the theater. Um, it's interesting because it's not necessarily the most faithful representation, right? Um, it's really hard to do a travel adventure for the stage. It would take a lot of sets and things like that. So the Man of La Mancha as a musical stays more or less in the same place, right? There's not a, a whole lot of um, scene changes, okay? Um, and of course, the real book is him traveling throughout Spain everywhere, right? And so um, they also ground, um, you know, this in the relationship between Don Quixote and Dulcinea. And again, if you've read the book, he doesn't spend much time with Dulcinea, right? The point of Dulcinea is that he's not spending any time with her, right? He's off saving her, right, and doing quests for her, but uh, she's not really around, right? That's what knights did. So to love from afar, that was right. Um, but even the version. It takes a certain reading of the Don Quixote story that in the literature is attributed mostly to the German romantics, right? So there are many different readings and there's a lot of arguments of which is the correct reading. Um, what you'll see in a second, in Mexico and Spain, it, in the beginning it was just read as a farce. It was just silly, it was just funny, right? People liked it because it was kind of stupid and funny, right? And satirical. Um, but the German romantics started reading something else into it about you know how amazing it is for you to sacrifice yourself for a cause and how you know to dream the impossible dream that, that it really is about going after something right you have a dream and you put everything into going after that and even if you fail right that there's honor right there's a romantic honor in, uh, out of just going after it right and so doing your best to 
And so in that reading, Don Quixote is less of a silly satirical figure, right? He's starting to be taken more seriously, right? Um, and so one thing that, you know, like I said, there's been 400 years of figuring out how to read this book, right? And the fact that it's been around so long and it still captures our attention and is still incorporated, Panama, right, uh, uses it in a national stamp. When they had the 400 years universe, uh, anniversary, um, the euro, the two-piece euro, right, the two euro, um, had the image of Don Quixote and the um, windmills. And one of the most uh, funny things, um, Robert Bayless in his paper um, talking about how ubiquitous and how, uh, how much the image of Don Quixote has been commodified and proliferated throughout um, the world. Um, Believe it or not, in 2005, they named a space mission after it, right? So there's the Don Quixote um, space mission, and, and do you know what it does? It's, it's really a funny joke. Do we have something? Anybody want to guess at what it does? Here's now. Well, it probably will, um, but but they tried really hard, right? Um, so here's the satellite, right? The satellite is called Sancho, right? Sancho Pants is a satellite, and this is the image of what it will do if it needs to. Quixote runs into asteroids, right? <laughs> so what it is is an asteroid deflection system. So uh, all these movies coming out of Hollywood about meteors coming and destroying the Earth and da da da. So the European Space Space Agency decided they're going to build a system called the Don Quixote, right? And if any asteroid or comet of the of big enough size comes, the the satellite, the Sancho Panza, will detect it, and the Quixote will run and charge after it and, and blow it up, right? So that's the Don Quixote. But um, the point of Robert Bayless's uh, paper, his overview, is to really show the wide variety of the divergent interpretations, right? And the appropriations, how it's being used by all these other people made in the 20th and 21st century. And it has less to do with explicit ideological stance. And so people want to read this politically, right? People want to read it from Marxist frame or whatever, but it's being appropriated by multiple political sides. So Franco, in Spain, actually used Don Quixote in his own propaganda, even while Picasso was using Don Quixote to criticize Franco, right? And so you see that. Um, so there's no explicit ideological stance that the author actually gave it, right? Um, it's more about the circumstances in which it's being used and received um, as, you know, time passes. Um. <laughs> what do you think it is? The satellite looks like Don Quixote and the, um, the asteroid looks like Sancho. Uh. Because the asteroid is fat and the satellite is skinny. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. All right, so there's also a really important tradition um, in English, right? So um, uh, Emmett Tabor Bennett goes through all the sort of imitations um, in the United States and Britain. Um, transatlantically. There's a whole project at Texas A&M that um, collects all these versions, right? So there's a whole library of just Quixote um, versions, right? What I want to focus on is uh, Quixotic imitation in Mexico, right? Because that really kind of gives life to the tradition that the authors that I want to talk about follow. So there's a really good book published in 1968. So up till 1968, it kind of catalogs every appearance of Don Quixote in Mexico, right? Which is a pretty ambitious project, right? Um, there's a debate, right, about when, uh, when Don Quixote arrived in Mexico. And part of that debate um, argues that it couldn't have happened very soon because the Inquisition, they disallowed it. It was on the book of, uh, it was on the list of banned books. Right or books to be burned, and so these it would have been politi politically very dangerous and difficult to get a copy of Don Quixote to Mexico, right? 
Um, but the author was able to find some uh, boat records, right, inventories that shows that basically the first time that Don Quixote appeared in, in Mexico was when it was first published. So in the same year, 1605. And then later what happens, it becomes very, very popular, right, gets off the Inquisition's list, um, becomes popularized, and they actually use it in colonization. They use it as a text to teach Spanish to the native indigenous populations, right? And so it becomes popularized really quickly. The first appearance in public, like physical appearance, um, of the figure of Don Quixote uh, was in 1621. Uh, Mexico at the time was being called Nueva España, right? Um, and they kind of look like these, uh, these big figures. Something like Carnival, right, in Brazil, like these kind of Mardi Gras uh, celebrations down the streets, these processions. They whipped out a couple of huge puppets of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, right? So already by 1621, the book was so famous that it would appear in a public parade and as a fun figure, right? And basically, um, the, the argument of the book is, um, durante muy largos años aquí como en España, no se vio en la más genial de las novelas sino cosa de mera diversión y de risa. So really, when they're reading it, they're only reading it as a joke. They're only reading it as satire, is the argument of, of this author. So doing his research in Spain and Mexico, everybody just thought of it as farcical. It was entertainment. It was supposed to be funny, right? Um, they weren't making big political points out of it. En los primeros años, en muchos años y muchos años después de la uh, publicada la inmortal novela de Cervantes, dice Rodríguez, uh, Rodríguez Marín, nadie vo, vio en Don Quijote nada serio. They didn't see anything serious about it, right? Ni digno de grave admiración. And so nothing to really study nothing to really celebrate, sino solamente lo ridículo. <laughs> Only the silly stuff, the ridiculousness, right? De su flacura, so his skinny face. Y de su mania, his craziness, his crazy acts, like attacking windmills, right? Um, y lo cómico, right? De sus percances. So how funny all of his little misadventures were. Um, but it still was popular. It was popular for that reason, right? Um, and so the first edition that was published in Mexico by Mexicans on a Mexican printing press came out in 1833, right? So it took a while. They're still importing versions from Spain. Um, but the first version in Mexico was five large illustrated volumes, um, and so it had pictures. So it makes sense that this becomes a comic, right? A comic book and things like that. So one of the most famous representations of uh, Don Quixote in Mexico is this calavera, right, that was printed by um, Jose Guadalupe Posada, right? How many people have seen that, even though you didn't know what it was? Yeah, it's just a very popular image. It's out there, you'll see it around El Dia de los Muertos all the time. And it's published in a newspaper around the time of the revolution, right? So it's, it's coming out right around the same time that these novels are being written. And so in Mexico, Again, maybe three, four hundred years ago, it was thought as just silliness, right? But then things begin to change. And it, it gets appropriate, it gets used, right, in these sort of political rhetorical situations. And so that's definitely what's happening in these books. So why? Why does the image of Don Quixote, yeah? Okay, quick question. Um, with the book, yeah. Um, so within the book, within the story of Don Quixote, is Don Quixote um, behind, like it seemed like 200 years too late, or is the actual like publication of the story 200 years too late? No, so this is, when you're talking about quixotic imitation, believe it or not, I mean, the imitation begins with the writing of the book itself. So um, Cervantes writes this prologue, right, that actually encourages people to imitate it and says that it's basically an imitation of books that were written hundreds of years before. And so... And like, like, like when Don Quixote is you know, walking around like in, in the story, like, 
are people like, why are you wearing? Um, exactly. So are people are laughing at it. In the story. Yeah, that in the story. So that's why it's a joke. And so that's why he seems like such a crazy figure, right? So this crazy figure that's attacking giants and armies, he attacks an army of sheep, right? Because he thinks the army's invading. Um, and so, you know, he has to save everybody from this army of sheep. So, poking fun at the chivalric code, poking fun at the knight's errant, right? Poking fun at these illusions of values, uh, uh, these ways of sort of um, constructing honor and valor, right? Um, and loyalty um, that have been the traditional sort of uh, pillars of the chivalric code. Right? One, why do you do that? And two, why does that make sense for everybody? Why does that have such strong resonance for everybody? Right? Becomes a really fundamental question. And so in Mexico, in the context of Mexican American immigration in Mexico, why during the revolution then does this make so much sense? Right? That we would appropriate the Don Quixote uh, narrative. Right to make some really powerful political points. Right again, uh, when the antecedents didn't try to make political rhetoric out of it, they just enjoyed it and had fun with it. So one of the reasons I think is because one of the largest single waves of immigration to the United States in history, let alone Mexican immigration, happened during the Revolution. Right. So according to Cardoso, who's a demographer, more than one million people left Mexico and came to the United States during that period. Okay? That's 10%. One out of every 10 people in Mexico decided to leave and come to the United States. Okay? Mexico is now, right, but you see it begin then, um, the top source of immigrants in the United States. At the time, German immigrants, right, had, had greater numbers. So the only other country that even comes close to Mexican immigration was German immigration. Now you go to that Pew study that was done by Krogstad uh, Keegan, they actually have this visual map that shows like the concentrations of all immigrant groups in every state and which is the largest over time. And so it's really fascinating. Because you can see all the German immigration that came out to Michigan, Ohio, right? Um, and then it slowly gets sort of beaten back or eaten back by Mexican immigration, right? And now Mexican immigration kind of covers the entire U.S. map as the largest immigrant, right? With the exception of only a couple of states, right? And so this is what they're reacting to. Well, I probably need my book back at this point. I don't want to actually have to read from it. Um, so, Don Chipote, right, often elicits the same reaction um, as Sancho Panza's name, um, because a Chipote is that, right? <laughs> right? And as a child, um, you know, you know, boom, right? And that, even that makes a lot of sense, uh, the Homer Simpson, boo, right? Um, because that's Don Quixote, he's constantly doing do kind of things, right? And so, Las Venturas of Don Chipotle, one of those pericos bamen, um, is Daniel Venegas' appropriation or adaptation of the Quixote story, right? And he even, uh, in many ways, retains a lot of the tropes, even to the title and the names, right? And Don Quixote, as pointed out by a lot of the uh, theorists in the field, he encouraged imitation. He said that was part of, um, you know, the tradition and so Daniel Venegas is basically taking him up on it, right? Um, he's a journalist writing in Los Angeles because he's an exile, right? Being a journalist in Mexico even now, right? You write something negative about the drug cartels, you and your family would probably be killed, right? So imagine 100 years ago, right? You write something wrong, about the wrong political party in the wrong way, you're obviously going to become a target for assassination, right? The problem with the revolution is the politics in those kinds of turbulent political times, you might be writing for the team that's winning, right? And all of a sudden, now you find your team is losing. So you were the celebrated journalist one day, and now everybody wants to kill you the next, 
right? And so that's why journalists in particular wanted to leave Mexico or needed to leave Mexico. And that's the case of both Daniel Venegas and Conrado Espinosa. Right? Um, Conrado Espinosa, when we get to him, um, a very famous journalist um, before he left Mexico. And so, um, imitation, Don Chipote, just like Don Quixote, is meant to be funny, right? There's a lot of very ribald, um, like fart jokes and things like that throughout the book, right? Um, Don Chipote spends a lot of time in brothels, not knowing that they're brothels, right? Um, he thinks that women are coming on to him because he's attractive, right? He doesn't know, right, the kind of the rules of, of society that he's uh, dealing with. There's a very obvious Sancho Panza uh, in Policarpo. So Policarpo is his traveling buddy. They go together. Um, he even has an equivalent of Rocinante. So Rocinante is um, Don Quixote's horse, right? And Rosage, right, is to kind of give you a rug burn, right? So this very old, beaten down horse in the mind of Don Quixote is, you know, this beautiful knight stallion right this beautiful white stallion with uh flowing hair but the name rocinante gives it away this is kind of like a beat up old hag right um and so you have a dog and the spanish name of the dog is sufre lambre with the, you break into three different parts sufre and hambre right so just like rocinante is starving right the dog is starving um when I translated it, um, I, I called the dog skin and bones, right? Because it kind of represents in English, I slapped it all together, skin and bones, right? But it kind of represents in English that same idea that the dog is kind of dying of starvation, right? Um, La promesa aquella inacabable aventura, right? So from part one, the first chapter, line 20 of Cervantes' Don Quixote, Don Quixote is memorized, he's enchanted, he's inspired by endless adventure, right? That's what it's, so the question is, what is that endless adventure and who's tempting him? In Don Chipote, um, it's Pitacio. So a guy comes back to his little village, he's all dressed up, he has a new cowboy hat, he has new cowboy boots, he has a big belt buckle, right? And so he goes to um, Don Chipote, and Don Chipote is really blown away. I'm just looking at the time. I probably don't have time to read a lot. Um, he's just blown away. Like, how'd you get all that stuff? You were like the dumb kid in class, right? Um, and all of a sudden you disappear, and nobody's really sad that you're gone, right? And then you come back, and you look like a million. What happened? And he says, well, I went to the United States, right? And I started making those pesos that are worth twice as much as our pesos here. And he's like, what do you mean pesos that are worth twice as much as the ones here? He said, well, the, the gringo pesos, right, are worth more. And so that temptation that you can make money, right, becomes the sort of illusion of uh, Don Quixote for Don Chipote and Policarpo, right? This belief, and, and really, Sancho Panza, in the original, he's also tempted by that same idea, right? Uh, Don Quixote says, we're going to go on an adventure, and Sancho Panza says, well, what's in it for me? Right? You're a rich landed gentry. You know, I'm just your poor servant, so what am I going to get out of it? And he says, well, didn't you know, right, that the squires of great knights, they always get, right, the, the winnings from war and battle, and, and they always end up with big tracts of land and, and islands, right? And so you're going to get your own tropical island, right? And this, again, has resonance with colonization, right? The discovery and conquering of Hispaniola. These very poor soldiers all of a sudden end up with these huge tracts of land, right? Uneducated, da 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 But because of the colonization, they end up being very, very wealthy. And so the windmills... For Don Chipote, really is the American dream, right? The enchantment, right? Um, in Don Quixote, he's constantly talking about who's being bewitched and who's being enchanted. And Don Quixote always says everybody else is being enchanted or being bewitched, 
right? He's the only one that sees reality, right? But we know from the story that he's kind of seen things. He's kind of seen uh, these illusions and these dreams that don't really make sense, right? And so the illusionment uh, and the enchantment um, that Bhitasu makes is to go follow the American dream. Go up north, make yourself rich, right? It's kind of funny that there's even a copy of the scene. Don Quixote kind of has to make his own armor, and he fights a barber who he thinks is like a villain just to win his helmet, right? And things like that. So it's not even good knight armor, right, that he has. And, and so it's really funny the way he kind of outfits himself. Um, you have a similar scene in Don Chipote. Um, he has to sew new underwear because he only has one pair of underwear. You know, all these kind of uh, funny, silly things. What happens in the end, though, is eventual disillusion. And at least in Don, uh, Don Chipote, they do it in a funny way. Um, Don Chipote ends up in L.A. And he does really silly things, like he goes to the movie for the first time, and he thinks they're witches, and he thinks he's in hell, right? Um, in a very sort of uh, Don Quixote-like scene. Um, he's afraid to open his eyes and watch the movie and, and things like that, because he thinks it's sorcery and magic. Um, but eventually, he finds a job, right? He's like a uh, working construction in LA, and his wife gets really mad. Right? He's sending money home, but she starts getting jealous, and she thinks for sure he's got a girlfriend, and he actually does, or a very girlfriend, right? So she was happy to stay back with Pitasio, who convinced them that she both to go in the first place, because she, it was kind of shacking up with him. And there's some really funny letters, right, um, that she sends to Don Chipote, hoping that he's doing well and wanting to let him know that Pitas is taking really good care of him, right, her, her. Um, and so, you know, she begins to get jealous, and so she goes to L.A. to find him. And she basically drags him back to Mexico by his ear, you know. <laughs> and so um, the way that it ends, right, is he's still dreaming, he's still locked in his dreams, right? Um, y mientras tanto uh, soñaba, so he was still dreaming. Y en sus sueños veía pasar como cinta uh, peliculera las amargas aventuras de que fue protagonista. So all of his very, you know, terrible experiences, because he does have some um, pretty bad experiences of exploitation, right? Y pensando en eso, all these dreams, llegó a la conclusión de que los mexicanos serán ricos en los Estados Unidos cuando los pericos van. <laughs> so never, right? When, when pigs fly, basically. Right? Um, and so he ends up disillusioned, but uh, in a funny way. And so de Texas, we get this later reading of Quixote, which is very tragic. Right? And so instead of the silliness, he has this old man, and it looks like he's suffering from dementia or something. Right? He, he basically is losing his mind. And so he's suffering from like mental illness. And people are just laughing at him. And people are just like making fun of him and going along with all of his craziness just to see what he'll do next, right? So they can keep teasing him, right? And in the end he dies, right? And so there's another reading that isn't satirical or comical at all. It, it's sort of about madness, right? And one losing their mind. Um, and so, and so that Texas takes that much more serious look, right, at the Quixote figure. Um, it's still an imitation, right? But it's a novel about tragedy and disillusionment, in the end, insanity, right? Um, so the, the figure, Don Alonso uh, Quijada de Salazar, that's Don Quixote's real name, right? Um, and so you have Kiko, right, which reminds you of the Quijada, Quisada, um, Quixote. Um, he has his own dog named Capitan, which also is a very sort of chivalric, knight-like uh, name to give to a dog. Um, he actually travels with his wife, so his wife doesn't have to come and get jealous and beat him up. Um, I'm not sure, I'm still kind of working on this. If Don Serapio is like a Sancho Panza, or if he's just like a second example of a Don Quixote. Um, he's also traveling with his sons. 
And what they're chasing is also the American dream, right? And so, volvería uh, rico, traería suficiente dinero para comprar un terreno. They're going to make so much money, and then they're going to go back to Mexico and use that money to buy land, right? That's the dream. That's the impossible dream that they're going after, right? And it speaks to when things calm down, after the revolution is over, right? So we're going to leave all the craziness and chaos. We're going to make ourselves rich in America, and then we're going to go back after things have calmed down. And so... Um, Nicolás Conelos is a theorist, and he talks about a lot of Latino immigrant literature has its sueño de retorno, right? Dreaming of the return. So immigrants, first-generation Latino immigrants, as well as other immigrant groups, they actually have convinced themselves that they're going back, right? And so that's kind of the premise of this novel. Um, Conrado Espinosa is explicit about making these ties to Don Quixote in a different way. So uh, Daniel Venegas is really sort of imitating with the characters and the settings and some of the scenes. Conrado Espinosa actually writes in very concrete ways, making these comparisons, right? Very explicit ways. He's basically saying that all of these million Mexican immigrants are either Sancho Panzas or Don Quixotes. Right? And he writes about this at length, and making these comparisons. And so, um, he has these scenes in San Antonio where you have all these immigrants and they're all eating, you know, in the public squares and things like that. And on the one hand, you have the public figure, right? Um, just like the parades, you have real Don Quixotes and Sancho Panzas as clowns and minstrels will play songs at your table and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you have what he's using as a metaphor, right? So basically, all these people that have had misadventures in the United States, they're barely able to feed themselves, right? Um, these are your Don Quixotes. Um, your Sancho Panzas are your gluttons. These are the very rich politicians, the very rich generals, um, that came, or the few that um, became rich, and they're not necessarily helping out their community. The book ends very, very tragically, right? Um, and so, basically, the premise is that everybody coming to the United States on these quixotic adventures to follow the American dream, you're insane. You're fighting windmills. You're fighting armies of sheep. Right? There's no way that you're going to do this. And so, um, the, this is why I'm thinking that Don Serapio um, and, and Kiko are both Don Quixotes, right? Because the Don Quixotes are the ones that the Mexican immigrants where this dream doesn't work out, right? And it ends in sort of tragic consequences. And so, um, Kiko loses his daughter to prostitution. Loses his son to alcoholism, right? And basically can't return to Mexico because of the embarrassment and the shame. So coming to the United States, Don Quixote is so much about protecting traditional values, right? The valor and the honor and the truthfulness, right? And the trustworthiness of knights, right? And so basically what you get with Kiko and his family is the exact opposite. Coming to the United States corrupted the family's values to the point that they can't even go back to Mexico. And so the sueño del retorno has been destroyed for them. They, they can't dream about coming back. So he finds a good paying job, right, in Beaumont, Texas, um, working in petroleum, right, which is still a pretty good job, yeah. And, but his pursuit of money, that madness, has destroyed his family, okay? Don Serapio loses his youngest son, and who uh, both of his sons are very faithful. They maintain these traditional values, but by working on the track, his son actually dies in a very tragic way. His father forgets something. He, for, his father forgets tools back in a different area of the track, right? And his son, being a good, loyal, you know, obedient son, um, goes back to get the tools for his dad, so his dad won't have to do it, and he gets hit by a train. 
And so Don Serapio loses one of his sons. And so in this moment, in this uh, exchange, they're basically comparing notes because they've been, you know, they've been split up. So Don Serapio ends up in um, Georgia and basically what's akin to like a Georgia chain gang working on the uh, uh, railroad, almost like slave labor. Um, and Kiko ends up working in petroleum, right, near Houston and, and Beaumont. Um, and so they're comparing notes. And so the ending, I'll read it in English. Um, and so they walk basically to the El, El Paso, um, to the Juarez uh, train station. And, and they're saying goodbye to each other. They remain standing on Mexican ground. With a heavy heart, Kiko started his march north. Now, far in the distance, he turned around and practically shouted at them. So this is the one who's too embarrassed to go back to Mexico. Go on, tell our com uh, comrades to take it like men, which is an interesting uh, switching of the kibbutz, to stay in their homeland. Okay? Here, it's easier to find death and dishonor than money. Or riches. Okay. And so the Spanish bias it. Dígales a los paisanos que se aguanten como hombres, que se queden en su tierra. Así se encuentra más fácilmente la muerte y la deshonra que el dinero. Okay. And so it takes a very tragic sort of spin on what happens when all your dreams are crushed. Right? Um, and so that's another different reading. Um, of, of Don Quixote. In both cases, they're both um, imitations, right? They're both very much stylized after the Don Quixote, and they both end up with the same conclusion. Although one is kind of funny and silly, and the other is very tragic. And so um, it was basically a comment, or the books are basically comments on what's happening in Mexico in the time of the revolution, the chaos, and the, the purported solution, right, of the American dream. And how, in a very racialized society, um, the American dream isn't accessible to Mexican so, yeah. Thank you. Take any questions? Yeah. It just seems like, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Bramer, at this time in, in our history in the United States and the immigration problem, that this books really have a lot of meaning as far as what we're facing today. I mean, we, the people that have come, our ancestors, whatever, I mean, it's, it was a great, great talk, but I mean, it really hits home. Yeah, for me, that's the most tragic thing. And these books are 100 years old now, and nothing's changed. Right. The kind of abuses, you know, that they're experiencing in the, in the novels um, are very real today. Um, even the kind of experiences that they have when they're being checked at the border checkpoints, and um, there's mentions of repatriations and those kinds of things too. And so the conditions for Mexican immigrants haven't really changed very much. And so the, these stories are just as relevant now as they were in Israel. I have a question. Uh, at one point, you said one of the books were banned. Yeah. Um, what was it banned in Spain or Mexico or? In so yeah, Mexico? the Inquisition banned Don Quixote in Spain and all of the Spanish colonies. So okay. yeah, that's pretty much half the world at that time. So smuggling that book uh, into Mexico was a pretty risky proposition. Why was it, ba it was banned because? Well, it was satire. In it? Yeah. Um, it, in certain ways, it's kind of dirty, you know. Um, it's very ribald and and very inappropriate, right? And so, if the church is trying to conserve, uh, you know, maintain a narrative about purity and goodness and everything like that, and you know, trying to keep young minds, impressionable minds, you know, on the right track, it, it kind of makes sense because you know, Dulcinea, she's probably a prostitute, right? Um, you know, and, and those kind of things. And so, um, and. Daniel Venegas picks up a lot on that as well. So even the name, one of those Pericos Mamen, um, you know, my publisher didn't like what I what I really wanted was I wanted to put when parrots suck, right? <laughs>
because it really gets to the grittiness and the dirtiness of it, right? The, the ribald nature um, and the inappropriate nature, right? And so my publisher wanted to um, go with something when, when parrots suckle their young or when pigs fly. Like, so pigs fly kind of gets the idiomatic sensibility of it, but suckle their young. Like I could hear like the violins in the background, right? <laughs> so, you know, what we what we ended up compromising with was breastfeed. Because at least breastfeed gets anatomical, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, a twelve year old mind, you know, would laugh, right? Like Beavis and Butthead would laugh at breast. He said breast, you know. And that's really the kind of sensibility of why, you know, he says pity goes mama. And so those are probably the reasons, you know, from the church's perspective why you know, 400 years ago, uh, Quixote was kind of disallowed because there's a lot of little dirty jokes like that. Any other questions? <laughs>